am a storyteller, basically. Um, I get paid a pretty good living to tell stories about complex issues and help answer questions and have answer questions for people who didn't understand things before. And I also am an applied microeconomist working in rural development, which means that I work with farmers and I do things like measure the impact of rural roads and piped water systems in villages and things like that. Now, in this case, this is an example, these extension workers in East Timor are getting ready to take surveyors out to remote villages to talk with project farmers, ask them endless lists of questions, count their trees, and measure their garden plots. Now, when they get done, and the numbers, the data is all entered, this is what I get. <laughs> now, wait, wait, don't leave yet. Block the exits. Um, this, you might think this is mind-numbingly boring, but these are my pots of paints. These are the numbers that tell the real stories. My stories usually have several parts. First is the technical stuff, which really comes from those numbers, and that is, is it a good investment? Second is the more practical part. So when these trees that the farmers have planted mature and really start producing, how much cash is the cooperative going to need to pay the farmers for their harvest? Ooh, they get caught a million dollars short in East Timor in that harvest year, and I am in big trouble. <laughs> the third part is the color part. Sometimes it's the most important. So in this case, the cooperative has just purchased the, a good-sized chunk of product from this farm family. And notice who is holding the cash and who is not. That's important for a lot of reasons. I like to think that a good economist is really just a good storyteller, but my stories are based on numbers and facts and not imagination. So in 2017, I was, I had, was sitting at home in Ubud, Bali, and I had just received this exact same data set, all of those terrible numbers. And I was crunching numbers at my desk on a deadline, when after 54 years of a long, deep slumber, Mount Agung Volcano woke up. Now, Agung dominates the skyline in Bali, as most of you know, and it also is a central factor in the lives of most Balinese. Um, Google Maps says that it sits 32 kilometers line of sight from my desk. So that's close enough to be a presence every day in my life, too. I look to the press for information, as you do, and I found hysteria completely devoid of facts. And you know how I feel about facts. So this last one is my favorite, and it is from an unnamed German travel magazine. And I did not change one word of that headline, I swear. That's what it said. So my friends and family were sending me messages asking me if I was safe and when was I leaving. But quite honestly, I couldn't find anything credible to convince me that I should. Bali, most of Bali and all of the streets of Ubud were empty. And for those who remained, the fear was really palpable. Um, the agency that puts out the information from the government does it in Indonesian, as they should, but it meant that a lot of people could not access that information. So how can you make sensible decisions if you don't have clear, understandable information? Meanwhile, my friends in Bali were all off doing extremely useful things for the 40,000 evacuees that were coming down off the volcano, while I was stuck at my desk in Ubud crunching numbers on a deadline. Well, that didn't last very long. 
So I decided that one thing I could do was spend a couple of hours a day, ha, 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 doing what I do best, what, doing what I know how to do, which is collecting numbers and seeing if I can find any stories in there. So I set out to find out who collects the data, what data do they collect, is it publicly available, and most of all, could I understand it? I found out, I discovered, that the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Indonesia has the agency that monitors volcanoes. It has the catchy title of the Center for Volcanology and Geophysical Disaster Mitigation. <laughs> now, with 129 active volcanoes, and 65 of them with permanent observatories, the bottom line from this is that our monitoring agency gets a lot of practice. Now, you might be thinking, might be thinking that Indonesia isn't exactly known as a science powerhouse. But in this case, you would be decidedly wrong. I repeat, wrong. Our monitoring agency is, does world-class work and is highly respected by volcanologists around the globe. The Eastern Division of Indonesia, which is headed by Mr. David Kamil Shabana, um, sets the international standard for a lot of the profession, and we are very, very lucky to have them. Now, one thing I learned from them is that volcanoes, like earthquakes, is a subject where what we don't know is a lot bigger than what we do know. And one thing we do know is that volcanoes are very unpredictable. That's the one sure thing. So in order to keep track of our unpredictable volcanoes, the monitoring agency puts an array of equipment all around them. And Agung here is the darker pink dot on the map on the right. Um, these, this equipment is in the form of specialized stethoscopes that listen deep down inside the volcanoes. And sometimes they're in the form that ping signals off of satellites so that they can calculate whether the volcano is inflating or deflating by even a fraction of a millimeter. And yes, volcanoes do that when they're active and they're building up pressure and deflating, inflating. They've added more GP, specialized GPS equipment to the volcano since then and definitely more dedicated cameras. So the, a lot of the data that they collect is streamed live onto the internet 24-7. And the, a number of the live cameras, the CCTVs, are live streamed onto YouTube. So there are no secrets in Agung. There are very few secrets in Agung if you know how to read those. Now, what could I use? Well, I'm a California girl, and I learned how to read a seismogram in primary school because in California, that's what you do. <laughs> now, the seismogram here is the one on the bottom left. So the monitoring agency also puts out volcanic activity reports, VARs, for Agung every six hours, which includes a fair amount of detail on the seismic activity. So I decided to start collecting those numbers and tracking them and posting them on a Facebook page that I started called Mount Agung Daily Report. I also post English translations of press releases that they issue, official press releases, and short summary papers that they put out. Um, also some educational bits and pieces on volcanoes that I think are of interest and accessible to at least some people. But based on the data and what I've learned about volcano facts, I try to describe what's happening in Agung in simple, plain English. Only facts, no techno jargon, uh, no amateur speculation, and most importantly, no drama.
So at first, these descriptions, I always have a bit of a visual story to go with it. So at first, I just started collecting the total number of seismic events every day. And this covers the period from the end of September every day to almost the end of November. And I started collecting these numbers because they were huge and getting scarily bigger. If you look at the scale on the far left-hand side, that's a thousand seismic events every day. That was scary. And whether they were small or big, it really doesn't make any difference because that's just a lot of movement. But no, no eruptions in here, not a single eruption. It wasn't until just after this period when we started getting our first eruptions in Agung. And this remarkable photo is captured by our Ubud-based photographer, Rio Helmi, over there. Thank you. And faced with this overwhelming drama, and believe me, all of Bali was glued to YouTube for those nights. <laughs> Based with this overwhelming drama, it just reinforced to me the need to have reporting that was calm, measured, and factual. That's the drama. I've learned a lot about, uh, I've learned a lot about volcanoes in this process. And Agung has gone through two long phases of eruptions. The first phase was really dramatic, like we saw in, these, in the first photo there. And the second phase was pretty routine, if you can call an erupting volcano routine. But, you know, we were getting an ash column to a predictable height pretty much on average every five or six days. It was routine. Um, but so as Agung changed its behavior, I changed the way that I visualized the story also. The numbers of seismic events are way, way down. But I decided to start focusing on size of key events in and under the volcano that represented magma moving up and cracking rock. And those are the events that are more likely to lead to an eruption at some point. And the eruptions on here are the little black dots. And we haven't had an eruption since June 13th, so it's about 120 days, roughly. Um, it's been a while. So I have also been extremely fortunate to develop some really critical partners in this storytelling. Um, Rio Helmi sends us, sends me, he'll tell you I steal them, but he sends them to us. He sends us fabulous photographs of the volcano and the people who live on it. Um, Jackie Zwallen, if you've seen this, if you've seen the, the site, Jackie Zwallen sends these fabulous time-lapse videos which you don't know, but she takes them with a little GoPro that she has perched on her back terrace right at the foot of the volcano. Where is low tech? <laughs> and then um, Elang Erlanga, who um, was still in university when this started, is a smart young geodesic engineer who is our informal technical advisor and my teacher of all things volcano. <laughs> so he explains to us what can be seen from in these great infrared satellite photos from the European Space Agency satellite as it goes over the crater of the volcano. He also says you wouldn't believe how much PULSA or prepaid mobile credit it takes to download satellite data into your cell phone. It's a lot. <laughs> so with those three partners, we've been able to sustain this. And they all add very important parts to the story. Now, while I and 25,000 Facebook subscribers think this is a pretty useful way to keep track of what's going on in Agung, I'm not so sure that our experts at the monitoring agency would completely agree with us. In one of the great all-time TED Talks, the African writer Chimamande Ngozi Adichie talked about the danger of a single story, how life is really very complex, always, and that when you focus on a single perspective for your story, it allows you 
to ignore that complex periphery. And that can lead you down the wrong and sometimes dangerous pathway. So I try really hard to remind readers that seismic activity is not the only factor in these eruptions. That eruptions are very complex processes. The experts at the monitoring agency have much more information and data than we do, and they actually know how to read it. And even they are very, very reluctant to make predictions, like never. So I have <laughs> learned that that reluctance is very well founded. Two weeks after this full moon eruption in May this year, just a few months ago, we were sure, the four of us were sure, we were positive, Agun was getting ready for a big eruption any minute. So the four of us gathered out on this hot, windy, concrete rooftop out in the east. We set up the camera equipment and we watched the top of the volcano because it was going to erupt any minute. Any minute. So four days and four nights and a lot of instant noodles later. <laughs> nothing, nada, zip. Kosong. So the noon on the fifth day, I said goodbye to my friends and abandoned them on the rooftop. And I was 15 minutes, literally, down the road in the middle of those clouds on the south side of the volcano when they video called me and said, it's now! <laughs> so volcanoes will teach you patience, whether you like it or not. Will Agung erupt again? Yes, definitely, no question about it. When? Well, I don't know. And even my technical advisor just shrugs his shoulders and says, Agung is the boss. <laughs> but I'm sure there are a lot more stories to be written for Agung, and it's very likely I'll be collecting numbers for another while yet. So thank you very much.